this devlog, I'm going to show you how I added something to my game that I've been missing for a while. A collision system. Yeah, believe it or not, there actually wasn't one there before, which made things like the procedural dungeons extremely boring. And just because I love you all, I'm going to tell you how I'm preparing for mod support and the weird technical hack I had to put in to actually enable it, which I'm surprised worked. I took this opportunity well away from the gameplay wall to work on technical and infrastructure bugs, which is totally riveting. From last week where I focused on adding a new type of technical dungeon, it, it became totally obvious to me that I needed to fix the collision system soon because it was really just standing in the way of the gameplay. So this new collision system is built entirely in C++ for efficiency and is based on the same sort of logic that I use for the trigger system. However, this logic was mainly built for the procedural dungeons, which take a very different approach to what the overworld looks like. So this collision system also had to offer you to be able to test collisions based on a grid. So you're the player and you're walking around the world and your character collides with something. Then what happens? Well, you would say that if the collision has taken place, the player is then not able to move. But here's an issue. You've already moved into that thing. So how do you move back out? Because if the logic is then going to be saying, are you colliding with anything? And you are, then it's not going to be able to let you move at all. So you might end up with a situation where the player collides with a wall and then can never leave. To prevent this system from being too much like visiting Ikea, there's actually a really simple solution for this, which is to check if the collision has actually taken place before the player moves. And if you detect that the collision has taken place, you then return and prevent the player from moving in the first place. This was actually quite similar to something I put in the game before, which was not allowing certain enemy types to be able to visit certain types of terrain. So for instance, the squid enemy would not be able to go on the land, and certain land enemies like the skeleton would not be able to go in the water. Now I've decided there's lots of things that are going to need to be able to collide with each other. The best thing to do would be to implement this as an entity component and get it totally out of the active enemy class, which I don't want it in there anyway, so get out of there. Every entity in the entity component system is aware, at a bare minimum, of where its position is, which means that there's an entity set position function in the entity manager class. So what I eventually decided to do was add a set position potential class to the entity manager which would be responsible for dealing with any position checks. Some of the components would then be able to take an interest in where the entity is actually trying to position itself. I started testing this logic by implementing this new traversable terrain component, which does a lot of the checks that used to be done by the active enemy. If the enemy happens to have a traversable terrain component and that comes back in a way that says the enemy shouldn't be allowed to walk in that place, then the potential function would just say, no, you can't move there. So this was all laying the groundwork for the collision component, which came later. And by the way, this system is written in a way where it doesn't actually return true or false. What it instead returns is a position, which is a position that the system thinks the player can walk to. I want to be able to allow things like the player to slide when they come against the wall. Now, often what you'll get with player character controllers is when a collision takes place, they won't necessarily stop moving, but they might say slide against the wall if it's a sort of like an angle. This is often done because it's just way nicer to use than like the player just stopping abruptly when they hit a wall. Um, I haven't actually implemented any of that logic yet. Currently it is basically is a binary true or false. Uh, and, and if the movement fails, it just returns the old position. All the groundwork was in place by that point. All I really had to do then was write a collision world, which is able to return true or false, depending on whether the player had actually collided. So I just went and recycled the collision detection world, which was already in place and used as part of the trigger world and implemented it all in C++. This system allowed me to get simple collision with round objects in the game very quickly. Even though there's this sliding, it's still perfectly usable. On top of that, I then went and added the grid collider system for the dungeon. So this essentially works by finding all tiles in the grids the player might be colliding with using a square and then checks the distance individually. The game's scripting code can just pass in an array of true or false values to tell the C++ implementation whether that specific tile in the map is collidable. So it's way more efficient than just adding a bunch of rectangles to the scene and hoping for the best. And with that, the game now has a collision system which works perfectly in the dungeons. And I also added collidables into a few other places in the game. So for instance, the goblin campsites produce collision radiuses, which kind of gives a bit of incentive to actually go in and destroy them. I don't really intend to give things like colliders to the trees just because there are a lot of them, but I don't know, maybe I could try that out. Well, let me know in the comments. The rest of this week was mainly just general improvements of the gameplay. I wrote a test to check the world stacking procedure, which actually found some interesting issues when doing so. The main one being that if you switch the world using a keyboard input, some of the player's update methods might call a null pointer. I added a proper wait and sort procedure to the dungeon, so smaller rooms don't get all of the items. And I fixed an issue with the player indicators in the minimap, 
I also added proper sample block support to the engine, which is something I've been missing for a while. Essentially, this means I can sample images differently for textures generated in code. This solves the issue with the minimap, where it was always really blurry because the texture itself was only like 50 by 50. Now it's nice and pixel perfect. Now finally, I've totally reorganized how I load projects into the game. Now you might remember that there's an open source bit to this project and the closed source bit, which is essentially the commercial bit that I'm gonna sell. Now previously in the open source base, I checked specifically for that bit of closed source code. What I've now done is introduced the concept of a base implementation, which is essentially just an interface that allows you to check for things like updates, um, and also just load specific files for things that you need. So essentially the way that the closed source base attaches itself to the open source base now is it almost behaves as if it was a mod. Like it's just this modular piece of code that can be loaded in and will add new content to the game. So in doing so, it also made modding support like a lot easier. And one of the biggest problems I've had for a while is that when defining things in the game, I'm using enums, which is essentially just like this immutable list of things that, that define stuff. So say I had items in the open source bit and items in the closed source bit, one of them would have to take precedent over the other. They couldn't coexist, which meant Duplication of code, everyone's least favorite thing. So to combat this, I actually had this totally ridiculous idea of the Christmas holidays. That what I could do was shovel all of the enums into this class, which would maintain them all in a single list and then define them all at once. And the way it does this is it, it essentially builds up a string of all the different enums in a way that it becomes valid squirrel code. And then it passes that squirrel code off to the squirrel compiler and runs it which then defines them all up front, which means that I don't have to deal with the fact that like you can't point it to a file or anything like that because it just dynamically generates code for you, which was a ridiculous idea and I'm, I'm shocked it worked, but it works really well. And the thing is that that prepares the ground perfectly for things like mod support or DLC support because each new piece of DLC can just be another base implementation and it can define all the new places or items or whatever in a totally modular way and it all just like you load whatever you want and the game starts up and it, it runs as you'd expect like it works quite well. I'll be back to talking about gameplay next week but in the meantime how about watching this video where I talk about adding creepy crawly bug nests to the desert.